I am Vinny Totorich, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there before long. You will be lean and mean, guaranteed, just like the guy on the other mic. It's the Friday show. You know, that means we bring in someone with crazy amounts of knowledge and they lay that knowledge down on us and we become smarter because of it. This guy's been on the show several times. Um, I consider him a friend, even though we don't get to hang out because he lives several states over. Uh, he's a cardiologist. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Nadir Ali. Oh my God, I love you, Nadir. <laughs> I love the applause. Yeah, it's, uh, I love the canned applause. You know, it's better than hearing this. <laughs> yeah, I never play that when guys like you're on. Um, Nadir, you know, I like to get you in once or twice a year, whether I need to or not, because your, your knowledge on health and the body and the heart and just everything else is just beyond beyond. And uh, I love that you're putting it out there. I love watching videos with you in it. And, um, and every now and again, you know, everything is so, you know, you know, just everything is just so spread out in particles and people are coming and going. I will literally get people who go, Hey man, I love you. I listen to every podcast. Have you ever heard of Nadir Ali? And it's like, well, wait, if you've heard every podcast, uh, why are you asking if I know who Nadir Ali? It's like when they ask me, have you ever heard of this guy, Sean Baker? Right? <laughs> yeah. I was the first podcast he was ever on long before Joe Rogan and everyone else, he was on this stupid show, right? Everyone passes through this show, no matter what. And uh, Nadir is one of those guys and, and you, sir, I appreciate you. And I appreciate that you're, you're doing this. Um, oh, first question, not right out of the box. The last time we spoke, you were streaking. Now folks, calm down. The man was not running through the streets naked. He wasn't going to a Red Sox game and running through the outfield with no clothes on. Nope. He's doing a different kind of streaking. He was riding his bike every day to work, which I think as a cardiologist, as a surgeon, th that's not the norm, right? Most of you guys pull up and, and, you know, electric Teslas and I guess that's the only kind of Tesla that's out there, but you know, Audis and Porsches and stuff, you're showing up on a bike, right? That's right, Vinny. Four years, uh, I came to work on a bike. Uh, I've given a short break recently because I had a bike spill, but uh, I'm going to get back to it. But it was about a few weeks shy, shy of four weeks that I almost never came to work in a car. It's a, it's wow. a 10 mile trip each way. So it's not an inconsequential trip. Uh, and I really enjoyed it, whether it was early hours in the morning when it was dark and raining and and no snow in Houston, but there were a few days of snow in that four years, mm -hmm. or whether it was at midnight or one o'clock in the morning going back. Um, so I enjoyed my bike ride. That's what keeps me healthy. It saves me time. I get to exercise. I love it. Now, and you didn't, you didn't miss a day of doing that, right? Like every day that you showed up to work for those four years on the bike, in, right? <laughs> in four years, I probably missed about uh, three days because of illness. Okay. Yeah. Something or the other came up. Either I had diarrhea, I was dehydrated, or I had something else, but it was about three days. That's, that's amazing. You know, I have a friend, he's been on this podcast before. He, he had the longest record on the rowing machine, uh, of, you know, Concept 2 rowing machine, just doing at least 2,000 meters a day. Now, he does a lot more than 2,000 meters because I think last I heard he was at 25 million meters lifetime because Concept2 keeps track of that kind of stuff. And um, so he does way more than 2,000 meters a day. But the deal was 2,000 meters a day, no matter what. And he did that even through cancer treatment in the hospital. He brought the rowing machine into the hospital, which I don't know which hospital allowed that, but they did. Uh, I think what ended his streak was, I want to say a heart surgery, where 
that was it. He he had to end the streak, and now someone else has the record, and that record is ongoing. But he's back. I want to say he's back over a thousand days already, right? But the record is now closer to two thousand days. Um, but I always marvel at these guys that are able to do these streaks. Uh, runners, as you may know, runners have these very long streaks where they'll run at least a mile a day. They, they can have diarrhea. They can have uh, anything going on in their life, no matter what, they run that at least a mile a day. Do you think these are good ideas, bad ideas? I go back and forth on this. How do you feel about it? I think a streak is one of the fundamental ways in which you can stick to a habit. I have a YouTube video on managing food addiction. And in that, I talk about a streak. It's so powerful that you don't want to break the streak easily, especially when you have done it for a few months, years, and then years turn into probably decades. And that kind of grounds you into a habit that might be very useful for you. So you should always try to keep a streak of something that's going to be beneficial to your health. Exercise is one of them. And, you know, we, exercise should always be optimized to recovery. So in other words, if you're crazy and cycling millions of miles and not taking recovery uh, time to recovery and you're not cycling slow back home, that can be detrimental. But a streak is a fundamental aspect of habit change, of willpower, of uh, staying within the bounds of what you want to do. I highly encourage that. I do too, but there is a thing, and this just came up. Um, I do this this group, we call it the VIP group. You know, it's, a, it's an accountability group that we have people check in twice a month, and I do. It's supposed to be an hour, but as of this moment, I've never done less than 90 minutes on these check-ins because people can talk and, and ask questions, and we go back and forth, and we have success stories and what have you. And it came to my attention during that group just uh, this couple of weeks ago that, you know, we had this one woman, Robin, who, you know, she injured herself because she's doing powerlifting three days a week, which in and of itself is not bad. But she was also trying to get to an hour on her rowing machine on the other days. And she was fitting in other things and she ended up hurting her shoulder. There was another woman, um, uh, Susie. And uh, Susie, you know, ended up wearing herself out by not taking a break. And a third woman, and these are all three women who follow me all the time. Just so happens that all three happen to be women. And the third one, um, uh, Megan. And um, she, she was getting ready for a 100K bike ride and couldn't understand why she was always tired and lethargic and worn out. She was definitely overworking. And then it was brought to my attention, well, the reason these people don't want to take time off is they feel like if they skip a day to get rest, that they'll never go back to it, right? Because these are not people who grew up athletically or anything else, or maybe they did, but they feel like, oh my God, I found something that works. I'm exercising, I'm eating right, I'm doing all the things. But if I stop for one moment, right? Is, is going to just dissipate. I'm not going to go back. So I do, you know, when I look at streakers, I always go, huh, is it is it a good thing? Or do you feel like you're going to lose control by missing one day? D do you get where I'm coming from? Uh, there is no question that you have a very valid point. And the valid point is that, like, let's say we, this is a nice segue into recovery. And if you are doing something to the exclusion of recovery. Like for example, I think that if you're compromising sleep to get exercise, it's a bad idea. If you're compromising your recovery time to get exercise, it's a bad, bad idea. So any exercise that you do, and if you're trying to maintain a streak, should always be targeted towards recovery. Because just like you mentioned, over-exercise 
without recovery will increase your allostatic hormonal load. Your cortisol will go up, your epinephrine or fight or flight hormone will go up, your heart rate variability goes down. All of these things are very detrimental to your long-term health. So if you're following a streak at the cost of evidence that is building up that you're harming yourself, then that streak is not worth pursuing. So there are no absolute truths, but as a general rule, a streak is a very good method of habit change, of willpower, of avoiding temptations. Um, and, and I highly encourage that. But with the caveats that you pointed out, I do not think that anything is an absolute truth and neither is a streak. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I was watching a video with you. I'm going to just switch subjects here just a little bit. We're going to bounce around a lot because I have a lot of questions for you today, dear. I think you and I feel the same way about fake sugars. Uh, you started off one of these talks, talk, you know, just talking about allulose. Mm -hmm. right? And whenever I go to some of these uh, conventions and whatever, and you know, everyone's like, oh, try my new chocolate thing has got allulose, or we're now making pancakes and the syrup has allulose, allulose. And, and the other one is monk fruit, on and on and on. Uh, the fake sweeteners and the almost sugars are the, you know, near sugars, as I like to call them. How do you feel about this stuff? It's a very good question. And the reason I got interested in allulose is because I have clinical experience with GLP-1 agonists. Now, I specifically use the term GLP-1 agonists because I didn't want to throw out the word ozempic. I wanted people to kind of actually go a little deeper into what ozempic is. Mm -hmm. And you got to recognize, and like many of the influencers and the people on the internet, like Sean Baker, Anthony Shafee, you know, just to mention a few big guys in the carnivore ar arena, I'm still a foot soldier, you know, I'm still way under the radar compared to all these guys. You know, nobody, hardly anybody knows me other than you and your audience. Uh, I don't believe that, but go on. <laughs> so my clinical experience in treating obesity and metabolic disease is it to give you, to put, you, put it lightly, for the last 12 years, I have seen on a consistent basis about 100 to 120 patients per week. So that clinical experience tells me that not everybody, like I would say 90% of people have the knowledge of what is the right thing to do. 90% of the people know that uh, processed food and sugars are bad for them. Almost all of them know that going to a low carb, sort of a natural diet with fasting and optimal exercise is good. But the problem is execution. And the execution has problems in our environment because we live in a very different environment right now compared to what our ancestors lived. And so the targeting <clears throat> by food industry by other people that are seeking our attention, like gaming industry, um, television, any media, mm -hmm. is likely to derail any health plan. So I recognize that. And so I've been using Ozempic as a method to let people or GLP-1 agonist, not just Ozempic alone, to help people regain some of their health. Now we can go, we don't want to talk about the pros and cons of Zempic right now because we are focusing on allulose. Right. So the thing that got me attracted uh, at allulose is that there are animal studies that show that it robustly increases GLP-1 levels naturally. So allulose is a uh, a fructose-like molecule. So there are six carbons in fructose. At one of the carbons, you basically switch the hydroxyl and the hydrogen group around with an enzyme called epimerase. And that gives allulose the properties that it cannot get burnt. 
In other words, you absorb it just like any other sugar, but it doesn't enter the cycle to get burned to energy, either in the liver or in the muscles. The liver does not convert extra allulose that you eat into fat. The allulose is almost uh, you know, eliminated unchanged in urine, but it goes and talks to the cells in the small intestines. These are called L cells that are making GLP-1 and it actually increases GLP quite dramatically, at least in my studies. Now, I don't know why the human studies to show that GLP-1 increases in humans has not been done. And I hope that thing is accomplished. Um, and the reason I got interested in this is because I said, hey, since Ozempic, in my clinical experience, has been successful in creating 15, 20% weight loss in a lot of people who have the knowledge but have been resistant to be able to execute it, whether allulose is an alternative. And you're right, there are many sugars or sugar substitutes that have come and gone, promising to be low calorie, promising uh, to create satiety. But I felt allulose was different and I wanted to give it a try. And I'm not completely convinced that it is going to work. I'm very early in my clinical experience with it. So have me on your podcast in about a year and I'll tell you how it panned out. No, I, w I would love to because <clears throat> we're always looking for natural ways to help people lose weight. You know, people think I'm against GLP-1s, meaning the drug form of GLP-1s, um, Ozempic, Wegovy, uh, um, Jordians, and what have you. And um, you know, my feeling is, you know, some people say, oh, well, you think people are lazy and they don't want to lose. No, I think everyone wants to lose weight. But when I've had a lot of doctors on this Friday show, the first thing they'll say is long term use of GLP ones, not a good idea. And then they'll state all the bad ideas behind having people on long, long term GLP ones to try to lose a lot of weight. How do you feel about that? I used to be resistant to drug therapy a lot, but over time I have recognized that we never were intended or meant to live. Our genome is not designed to live in an, in an environment of overabundant food that is specifically engineered to get us hooked. And right. wherever you go, you have all these signals coming in at you so a single strategy of saying that, hey, I'm going to educate the masses. I'm going to tell them about the pleasure centers of the brain. I'm going to show them how to improve their willpower. I'm going to give them the knowledge of what is the right thing to eat. And I'm going to be successful 100% of the time is a fallacy. Right. And because of that, in my clinical experience, I do find that GLP-1 agonists, so the two ones that you mentioned, uh, which is Ozempic and Vegovi, that they have the, the, the same drug, it's se semiglutide. Right. Jardians is slightly different. It's a GLP-1, uh, sorry, it's an SGLT2 uh, inhibitor, which works differently. But let's stick to GLP-1, Ozempic, Manjaro, uh, and also to Vegovi. Mm -hmm. It's clear that these drugs have side effects. So let's talk about the side effects. The side effects are that it slows down your gut motility. It uh, reduces gastric emptying. So when you use it, you got to train these patients and say that, look, if you feel nauseated, if you feel that you're throwing up, if you feel like you're getting constipation compared to what you used to be, then dose escalation is not a good idea. Many are given a path of dose escalation without actually monitoring their symptoms. The second aspect of them is that since they go and talk to your brain, uh, they actually reduce your satiety. I mean, they improve your satiety and reduce your hunger. So many patients come back and feel empowered. They are actually happy that they have this control over their life. You know, right. it's, it's something, and I have repeatedly asked my patients, 
has your quality of life improved? And they say, yes, because when I got up the next morning and I realized that I went to this party where there was this overabundance of food and I was able to resist it without using too much effort and willpower, I felt empowered. It improved my quality of life. So that's not something that is to be taken without giving some credit to the drug. The next thing that I observe is that the drug has dramatically improved uh, diabetes control. And in my clinical experience and in several studies, it shows that there is a reduction in triglycerides, which is fat in blood. There's a reduction in blood pressure. There is an improvement in good cholesterol. There is a reduction in insulin levels. In other words, your insulin sensitivity improves. So when you put all these benefits there, then you say, yes, I'm willing to try it. But there is no questions, there are downsides. We told you about the nausea, vomiting, and constipation. Right. The other, other downside is that there is not a great off-ramp. So the off-ramp meaning that, hey, how am I going to be able to take these people off this drug? Because when you come off the drug, you're likely to gain the weight back you're likely to start overeating. And we are hoping that by that time that there are a few other tricks that are going to come about. One of them may be allulose, maybe a substitute in which you take, like, let's say, a cup of decaf coffee at 10 a.m. in the morning with uh, a teaspoon to two teaspoons of allulose. And by the time it comes to noon, your GLP-1 levels are already high naturally. And you may not be as hungry and as wanting to eat during the time period that you are vulnerable. So there are a few things that hopefully we would be able to modulate. But even in the studies in which they have taken people off of semiglutide, the weight gain has not been 100%. They gain about 60% of their weight back. I mean, that's still tragic. Well, but wait, it did some benefit. Let me, let me jump in. Um, okay. Here. And I'm not trying to be antagonistic other than the fact that there are other sides of this. You know, you know I've been in the weight loss game for 40 years. Amazing. And the one thing I know for a fact, and you know, you can argue, anyone can argue with me all day long with this, but when you've done one thing in your entire life, your entire adult life, and I even wrote about this in my book, at first, I didn't teach my clients anything. I just got them to lose a lot of weight by saying, listen to what I'm telling you. The moment I would go away, they would gain the weight back. And then I figured out, oh, wait, I need to teach them something along the way. Mm -hmm. Right. By just handing someone a drug or injecting a drug into these people, the first thing that's going to happen is if there's no education, because you can't stay on a drug forever, right? Would you agree you can't stay on a GLP-1 forever? Probably not. No, a good you can't. Idea. But people have been, remember, these drugs are not new. No, no, uh, they, they've been used in, in, in reducing, jeez, uh, 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 the blood. 2005. AC-1s, they've been around since, you know, they, they've been lowering AC-1s. As I like to joke, when you watch the commercials, It'll say, hey, take take Ozempic, and you could get your AC1s down as low as 7.0. And I'm sitting there going, okay, take Ozempic, and guess what? You're still sick, right? Correct. Because you're still diabetic. So the drug doesn't even really work for what it's supposed to work for. It, if you're taking it, it's like, hey, we could get you below 5.6. Well, that's great. And you can you can use that and go low carb and get below 5.6. Maybe you're learning something if you go low carb. But if what I'm hearing a lot is, hey, have your cake and eat it. Just keep injecting this drug. Don't change your lifestyle. There's a lot of that. And you know the thing I'm hearing from a lot of people, because I talk to a lot of people, the nausea, right? And the constipation, I hear that a lot. Yeah, of course, you're not eating because you're nauseous all the time. Well, 
if that's an improvement in the quality of life, look, I, I get sick when I get on airplanes. My quality of life goes way down when I get on, a, on an airplane. It just does because I'm nauseous. Even with the, the, the drug I take when I get on the airplane, I'm still nauseous, right? Quality. I couldn't imagine going through life feeling like I'm on an airplane. I couldn't imagine that. That's not quality of life to, to me. Number one, so I'm not talking to unity, I'm talking to the audience. The other thing is, and I don't know where you are on this, but I've had uh, uh, everyone else on the show saying that you're taking a lot of muscle along with a lot of fat when you're losing weight on this. Do you have any knowledge to that? The muscle loss for the Zempic. Now, let me, uh, let me kind of, I want to get to muscle loss in a bit. You but sure, let sure. me address some of your other issues. Okay. So the nausea happens in a minority of people who keep dose escalating. Okay. So you're supposed to start at 0 0.25 for the first week, then go to 0 0.5, then 0 0.75, then 1, then 2, and then 2.4. So it's a five-week dose escalation. Sorry, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, you know, it's a dose escalation over five months. So not every week you're increasing it. You're at 0 0.25 for four weeks, 0 0.5 for four weeks, and stuff like that. Okay. So the two things you need to teach patients is that this drug is very effective if you combine it with a low-carb diet and you combine it with intermittent fasting because already it's telling the brain you don't need to eat. So it's easy to put in the effort to do intermittent fasting, go to one or two meals a day. The reason it's effective when you uh, make it... Uh, make the person consider low carb is because when you eat sugar, uh, and in fact, Dr. Richard Bernstein, uh, one of the gurus in diabetes is the first to point out that when you take a GLP-1 agonist and you eat carbs, it goes and tells the pancreas to make insulin. So you will lose some of the benefit of a GLP-1 agonist when you eat carbs. When you don't eat carbs, it doesn't give that signal. So you are absolutely right. It is not just enough to give them the tool of GLP-1 agonist. Along with that, you got to arm them with the knowledge that this drug will not be effective if you don't do fasting and low-carb diet along with that. Right. Now let's come back to the issue of muscle mass loss. So muscle mass loss is unlikely to be increased with uh, GLP-1 agonists, because unlike Jardians, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor, Jardians is actively promoting gluconeogenesis. Jardians is dumping sugar into urine, 150 grams of sugar into urine, which is quite a bit, right. uh, about a third of a pound or a little bit more than a third of a pound. And it finds and the body finds and makes the sugar by burning muscle. On the other hand, the accentuation of gluconeogenesis, in other words, breakdown of muscle mass is not as prominent. And I have not really looked at any studies that have shown that you're only losing muscle mass. You're losing both fat and muscle mass when you lose weight, sort of in proportion. So I'm not convinced that the muscle mass story with Ozempic is actually accurate. By that, you could say, I don't want people to do fasting because that's associated with muscle mass loss. Right, right. And the other thing to consider is that fasting is also so associated with increased autophagy. Autophagy meaning cleaning, self-eating, whatever it is. And the body is so smart that it is not going to burn up healthy biceps and other strong muscles that you have there, Vinny. I mean, although you're not showing it on this podcast. Oh, it's, it's underneath. Great. You should see it. It's, it's quite magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> At 61, I'm killing it. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is that the, the protein loss is going to be junk protein. This is going to right. be senescent protein in your brain, senescent protein that needs to be removed and now the body is being given an opportunity to take that trash out. So 
protein loss, muscle mass loss is not always a bad thing because we are in a dynamic state. In other words, you have to remove protein in order to build new protein. You need to remove senescent protein so that you get healthy. Let, let's go back. You mentioned autophagy. I have the note here to ask you about autophagy because so much, you know, people ask me, what about autophagy? What about the, you know, eating in a short window? I want to eat within six hours. And Jason Funk said to do A, B, C, and D. What's the truth about autophagy? I mean, you just started mentioning it with, you know, we got to take out some of the junk proteins. And what are all the pluses and minuses to autophagy? Excellent question. People say that, hey, you need to do fasting to get into autophagy. And you need so many hours of fasting for you to get into autophagy. And there is no right or wrong answer in this because autophagy is a continuous process. You are doing autophagy all the time. It's not like autophagy is stops completely when you start eating. And different people go into autophagy at accelerated rates based on their metabolic status. Like, for example, I take a young, insulin sensitive, exercising, uh, high muscle mass individual like you, and you are eating in a time window of, let's say, eight hours. Okay you are routinely accelerating your autophagy on a daily basis because you are insulin sensitive, your insulin levels are low. And so your autophagy mechanisms are likely to be a lot more robust than somebody who has a BMI of 35, let's say it's you know, about five feet, 10 inches, roughly around 250 to 275 pounds has insulin levels of about, you know, fasting insulin levels of about 15 to 30, who's got high triglycerides. This person may take a lot longer to get into proper autophagy. It might not happen at 24, 36 hours of fasting. So autophagy should be put in the context of that specific person and their habits. Now take exercise, for example. So I am in the habit of missing breakfast. When I get up in the morning and I do my bike ride to work, which is an easy bike ride, you know, I, I come here in zone two, zone two heart rate, you know, which, which means that the zone two heart rate does not increase my uh, tendency to go into cortisol excess or epinephrine excess. So when I do exercise, I accelerate the onset of autophagy. So these are all things that you need to put into the right context. And muscle mass loss is likely in a person such as yourself. If you now do a five to seven day fast, right? So you take an extremely healthy individual and you're putting them through a five to seven day fast. Now, they're not just going to be breaking down junk protein. And this is pure speculation on my part. I mean, there are no substantial studies. And I don't think that anybody can do studies that are accurate enough for us to know for sure. Oh, it's, it's but, impossible. You would have to lock human beings away in, in a lab, which can't be done. And it would be very expensive to do on top of that. Right. But and I, I'm not, I agree with you. But if we did IDEXA scan on you after five days of fasting, I would bet you would have substantial muscle mass loss. Right. So for a metabolically healthy person, I try to tell them that long-term fasting, when I say long-term fasting, meaning something that extends beyond 36, 48 hours, is perhaps not the kind of autophagy that you want to do. On the other hand, I completely agree with Jason Fung. If you take a, somebody who has, who's severely insulin resistant, BMI of 35, high triglycerides, obese, diabetic, 
the degree of benefit they're going to get from long-term fast is quite dramatic. Okay, let me play devil's advocate right there. I agree. I agree with you and I agree with Jason on that. But could we get or could we mimic or get similar effects by just, you know, take the same person, metabolically broken, you know, insulin resistant, the whole deal, the whole shooting match, and completely cut out carbohydrates, raise, you know, fats up, you know, to 65, 70% of the diet and the rest in protein and get a similar result, maybe not exactly the same result, but a very similar result, because that's the way I've done it for years with people. You bring a very interesting point. And I'm going to make a couple of observations here. And I have gotten, this is one area in which I have gotten a lot of hate mail. You know, in my YouTube <laughs> videos, people have gotten angry at me. People have made comments saying that I'm completely off. But these people have to recognize that I am seeing 120 patients per week. Mm -hmm. So I do have some clinical experience. So let's take an individual like that, you know, individual X, 55 years of age, BMI of 35, height about 5 feet 10 inches. Uh, let's say he is around 230, 240 pounds. Okay. He's got high insulin levels. He's a pre-diabetic. He's got high triglycerides. High triglycerides meaning the fat and blood is high. Mm -hmm. So you take you take this individual. He is already vulnerable. He is in a metabolic milieu in which triglycerides are high and good cholesterol is low. So the defense mechanisms to prevent fatty liver, to cause vascular inflammation, to cause cardiac events like strokes, I mean, like heart attacks and vascular events like strokes is much reduced in them. And to this individual, you give them the license to eat as much fat as they want as their main line of therapy. Okay. So what happens to them? Their fat cells are already filled. When they take in the fat, by the way, the fat gets dumped directly into the bloodstream like we may have talked before. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the fat bypasses the liver. It gets through the thoracic duct into the circulation. And the goal of the fat that is in the circulation in the form of a molecule called chylomicron is to go and dump the fat cells, the fat into the fat cells. So the chylomicron is saying, uh, my, my role is to go dump my cargo into a fat cell. Now the fat cell says, I'm already full. I can't take your cargo. So I have seen in my patients who go on this diet that their triglyceride levels, instead of falling on a low carb, high fat diet, actually go up for the first yeah. three to four months. So what is that fat going to do that's left in the circulation? It's going to try to park itself in the pancreas, in the liver, in the blood vessels of the body, and it's going to create mayhem. People may end up with cardiac events, vascular events. So a uh, diet has to be tailored to that specific individual based on their metabolic makeup. Um, it's not like I'm saying that this person, once he gets healthy, will be intolerant of a high fat diet for his entire life. Right. But what I'm saying is that the initial focus for this patient should be fasting, exercise, so that he is emptying the fat cells to make room for the fat that he's going to eat until his insulin levels come down, until the fat cells empty so that they can take in the fat that they are eating. So I think that uh, I deserve a little bit of a slack here because I don't have clinical studies to back it, but I have mm -hmm. clinical experience. I, I don't see healthy people like you in my office. I see people right. who are diabetic, with high triglycerides, with heart disease, with high blood pressure, and based on that, I have several YouTube videos about that a high fat diet might not be completely suitable in the beginning for people with such metabolic health. Yeah, no, it's, it's fair enough. You know, it's look, it, it's 
That's why we have these conversations because we're trying to figure it out. You know, we, we have a society of people that are broken and we're trying to fix them. We're trying to figure it out. And, um, I know fasting has worked for a lot of people. I, I know for some people it's worked for a long time and until it didn't work, you know? Um, so you, you, you can run into that problem too. Um, let's take a quick break here. I got to do an ad, but I want to come back and I want to get into vegetable oils, seed oils, and hopefully if we have time, binge eating. So we have a lot to talk about here. Folks, Villa Capelli olive oil. I think the one thing both Nadir and I can always agree on is Villa Capelli. Good olive oil is impossible to find. As a matter of fact, we're going to be talking about seed oils in just a minute. Here's the deal. A lot of oils in this country is cut up to 40%. It's crazy. And you can still call it 100% pure virgin olive oil. The government allows that. Villa Capelli olive oil is 100% pure olive oil. That's it. They crush the olives. They get the juice out. It's the only fruit juice I agree with is the juice of an olive, which is olive oil. The stuff is amazing. Um, I drink it. If I don't have a salad to put it on or put it in food, I'll just drink a little shot of it every day. I make sure I get my olive oil every day. Villa Capelli, longtime sponsor of the show. When you get to check out, put in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, and you'll get 10% off. If you spend more than $125 after that Vinny discount, you'll get free shipping. So go check them out at Villa Capelli. Uh, you may notice sometimes they're out of the oil. Put your name on the waiting list because they don't serve any oil before it's time, right? They only serve their stuff. They don't start buying from other countries and uh, mixing it with anything else. So you, sometimes you have to wait for the good stuff. That's just the way it is. Villa Capelli, promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E. We're talking to cardiologist, Dr. Nadir Ali. Um, Nadir, we would, uh, uh, olive oil, right? And they can cut it with seed oils. Now, we have a lot of processed foods in the world, and everything has seed oil in it. Hell, I remember going back, you know, just early 2000s, people were still you know, buying flaxseed oil and drinking it on, you know, tablespoon of flaxseed oil, you know, and oh, the omega-6 and the whole the omega-3 versus omega-6 and all of this. What's the truth behind vegetable and, and or seed oil? You kind of said it, uh, Benny. Uh, I think there are many people who rightfully claim, in my opinion, that one of the primary drivers of metabolic disease is not as much sugar as it is the increased consumption of seed oils because seed oils are uh, really highly processed high temperature it's not something our body is used to and when you consume it in large amounts because in the seed oil case the dose is the poison so if you replace roughly about 20 to 25 percent of your calories from corn oil canola oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil, uh, these are a few culprits, then these oils become a part of your body. They become a part of your cell membrane. Every cell in the body has a lipid bilayer, a membrane that is covered, that, that protects itself through fat. And it's a very flexible membrane. And that membrane is going to be really, uh, replaced from the natural fats that our ancestors used to consume, which is animal fat like lard and tallow and, and butter and ghee. Uh, and I don't really know how they got butter and ghee, but they are natural fats or fats from olive oil or avocado. With these seed oils, then our cells become vulnerable and, and very easy and uh, illustrative example for people to understand are your eyes. So the retina of your eye is constantly exposed to sunlight. That's how we see it's exposed to light. Right. And if you change the composition of your retina from it containing natural fats that you're eating to containing fats that you get from the seed oils, you should see an increase in age-related macular degeneration. Oh, wow. 
And one of the fastest rising epidemics in the world is age-related macular degeneration. So it, it is fundamental for us to understand that it is not just changing our eyes, it's changing the entire cellular makeup of your body that makes you increased at increased risks and vulnerability for cancers, for diabetes, for strokes. And if there is one single thing that your audience can do to improve their health, and it's something that is relatively easy at home, but impossible to do when you eat outside, is to go to your pantry and completely take out the seed oils and just throw it away. Don't give it to anybody because you don't want to harm anyone. Right. The increase in seed oil consumption is devastating a lot of our environment as well. And the final point, the two other points that I want to make about it. One point uh, is that my sister-in-law went to Costco and bought cooking, cooking olive oil, cooking grade olive oil. And I was trying to see what is this cooking grade olive oil? Do you know what it is, Vinny? I'm going to guess it's basically all seed oil. It is olive oil that has been altered with some amount of seed oil to give it the ability to tolerate heat. And so basically you're doing nothing other than selling a product that is detrimental to the health. It's nothing but uh, seed oil that is being given to you as olive oil. You, you know, what's amazing about that is that olive oil handles a lot of heat anyway. You know, they'll say, oh, you can't cook with olive oil. The smoke point, they'll, they'll say the same thing about avocado oil. The smoke point is way too low. And, you know, Anna Vocino, who basically, you know, is an online chef at this point, she goes, I don't know what they're talking about. You could get, you could get olive oil and avocado oil to a pretty high smoke point for cooking. You, you know, most, most, dishes you don't go much higher than that right but that's that's always been the lie oh the smoke point is too low on these oils which is bs well that's good to know that's information that i can pass it on to my patients yeah. and uh, uh offline i can find out this uh lady's name and see what her experience is with regards to that but the second point i also wanted to make is that many people come and tell me no, Doc, uh, we don't use any seed oils. It, it just, just doesn't happen. Right. So I turn around and ask them, how many times a week do you eat outside or bring food in, catered in from the outside? How many times do you eat out at friends' places? And it's astonishing that we as a society are learning not how, to, we are learning not to cook. We are learning to get food in from the outside. Yeah. We yeah. also go a lot to a friend's place. So it's to the point that I cannot eat at any restaurants. I cannot eat in the hospital cafeteria because almost everything, even hummus, even oh, yeah. hummus at yeah. my hospital ca cafeteria is made with seed oils. You know, uh, people have heard this story on the show before, but we generally will go out and eat with other people and we're very careful as to what we order. Right. And even at that, we know we're getting some seed oils. Right. Mm -hmm. And we just don't eat out anymore. We just don't, you know, I don't do fast food restaurants at all. We just tend not to eat out uh, to the point where when you're not used to seed oils, period, at all, whenever I do come in contact with them, I can feel, you know, I have a lot of old football injuries. So I can feel the inflammation hitting those injuries pretty good. And it was several years back, we were doing a, something in Ohio and we were off on an exit. You know, I was doing, you know, I can't remember what it meant. Was it a talk or maybe we we're doing a convention? I don't know what it was, but the exit we were off of at this, you know, Holiday Inn Hotel or whatever they had there, there were a few fast food restaurants right there. But we decided to go to the Red Lobster because I went, well, it's got lobster in the name. At least I know I can get a lobster, right? It's going to be expensive, but I'm going to get something good for myself. So I got the lobster and the drawn butter, right? I was like, how, how bad can that be, right? So I'm eating my lobster 
and I have the drawn butter and I'm dipping it and I'm eating in it. I even took my broccoli and dipped it in the drawn butter and I ate it. I'm sleeping about two or three hours later and all of a sudden my hands are hurting. My neck is killing me. Every bone I ever broke in my body, I'm, I, I can't sleep. My stomach, I'm, I'm slightly nauseous. I'm like, what the hell did I eat? To the point where at two o'clock in the morning, maybe three in the morning, I got up, I went downstairs in the gym at the hotel and just started walking on a treadmill. I, I felt like my body was just tightening up. I said, I just have to walk this out. I don't know what it is, I have to walk it out. And I didn't know the neighborhood, I didn't wanna walk outside, right? And uh, I was talking about it a week later on the podcast and a guy wrote in, he goes, yeah, you know, I used to work for a Red Lobster. That wasn't butter at all. That was a product <laughs> called Whirl, W-H-I-R-L. It's a shelf stable, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some kind of seed oil that tastes like butter. And all they do is they pour it in the thing and they put it in the microwave for a second to heat it up. And that's what they were giving us, stuff that tasted like butter. And it was 100% crap. It made me feel that bad because I'm just not used to eating that amount of that stuff. And if people don't understand how just how bad this stuff is, and folks, Dr. Kate Shanahan, who was one of the first people to start bringing this up on this show like 10 years ago, she uh, she has a book coming out, and we're going to have Kate. Uh, is that Kate's last book? Is that what you're about to hold no, up? No, no. I, I just wanted to plug in my friend also in that from whom I have learned about it, which is Chris Noby. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, so, I'd love, love to have him on the show too. I, I can't talk about seed oils enough. Kate's coming back on because she has a new book coming out, but she won't be on until June. So if you if you have a friend that you want to introduce me to, I will have this conversation over and over and over again until people understand just how bad these things are. Uh, well, Chris Noby has made, made it his life mission. He's an ophthalmologist. So he, like me, was a foot soldier. He looked into people's eyes and saw them getting macular degeneration and was wondering why that's happening. And he actually stays off of uh, the talk circuits, of the low-carb talk circuits, so that he could write this book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful book. I mean, by the way, it's, it's, it's amazing. So uh, Please I will introduce you to Chris Nobi. Yeah, yeah I, I would love to have a real conversation about that. I, I want to end with this. Um, Let's talk a little bit about binge eating because, you know, people do binge eat, right? Yeah, they could, they could be doing this. And that's why I started that VIP group that, you know, just to, to, so that people could be accountable. And there's a woman I'm talking to right now, right? Who I said every 24 hours, check in with me because she was losing weight. She was like at 90 pounds loss. She's probably got another hundred pounds to lose, maybe more. And, uh, she started binging, you know, she got, you know, she got into a place in her life and things just weren't working for her. I'm, I'm trying to stay away from exactly who it is. And I said, Listen, just give me 24 hours. Can you give me 24 hours? She gave me 24. Said, Another 24. We've now gone a whole week. She's now lost. I want to say seven or eight of the nine or 10 pounds she gained when she started binging. Because with her when you are metabolically broken, it just pops right back on, right? You, it just goes in reverse. What do you know about binge eating and what type of safeguards can people put in to protect themselves? So I must first admit that I'm not an expert at binge eating, but I do come across people who have failed on a daily basis. They, they, they know what they need to do, they're just not able to put it into execution. And so I try to learn tools through which I can help my patients. So recently I have been looking at the pleasure centers of the brain and how they drive us into addictive behavior. And there's a YouTube talk that I have, which is called, Are the Pleasure Centers of the Brain a Tantalian Curse? So it's a good story about tantalus. So, you know, when you hear that word tantalizing. Well, yeah, hang on. Uh, tantalus was, th that's a Greek mythology thing, right? Wasn't he banished to uh, an area with all of the fruit and vegetables he could eat? Is that, or am I making that up? No, no, you're not at all. Okay. So, so that's tantalus. Tell the tantalus story. Let's do that. 
I can't believe we Tant both know the story. <laughs> well, yeah. So Tantalus, like any Greek figure, he had done some crimes, and I'm not really sure what the crimes were. But the gods banished him to this beautiful garden that had a stream of water and delicious fruits. But he could never reach the fruits and never drink the water. So it's like he was constantly tantalized. Right. And from there, uh, I am taking that and trying to metaphorically evaluate us from the standpoint of our pleasure centers. So for the longest time, I used to think that dopamine is a pleasure chemical. Okay. That a dopamine hit that you see when you see a muffin, or for me, a chocolate dress leches. Or when I go to the doctor's lounge, the uh, chocolate brownie fudge ice cream uh, that mm. is made by different manufacturers. So looking at that, it creates dopamine arousal in your brain. And you think that that dopamine signal is actually a pleasure signal. It, when you consume that food, the increase in dopamine is going to bring about pleasure. But work done by several people, among them is Dr. Berridge and Dr. Kringleback. These are scientists who have worked on the pleasure centers, have pointed out that dopamine is not actually a pleasure chemical. It's a chemical that increases your desire. It increases your wanting. It makes you do the movement or the action to obtain your desire. But the rise in dopamine is not really associated with actual pleasure or happiness or satisfaction. Hmm. And this work has been brought to the masses in a very palatable way by a book called The Willpower Instinct. So if people want to look that up, they can look up that book. So people who binge eat the act of binge eating is increasing their dopamine levels, but that dopamine level is disasso disassociated with happiness or with pleasure. So in other words, there is a dichotomy. The, in people who are addicted, the dopamine is rising and they are, it's driving them to keep doing that behavior, which is binge eating. But when you look at the pleasure, the pleasure is actually falling. So the, even people who binge eat will tell you, I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm really not deriving pleasure from right. eating all of this food. It is just that it's a compulsion. And that compulsion is because that food is eliciting a rise in dopamine like any addiction does. And that's an important thing for us to point out to people that whenever you have this increase in want, whenever you, whenever you have this increase in desire, see that whether, try to stop for a minute and see whether the want and the desire is that aligned with you deriving pleasure from doing that activity or is it dissociated from that pleasure? And very often when you have that insight into it, you would see that that activity is not actually bringing you any pleasure. It's actually getting you displeasure. So you tend to either give up that activity completely or you find that you need it in very small amounts, that, that object of your desire in very small amounts to satisfy you. So as a clinician and as a person who's trying to improve health through your talk show, uh, Vinny, we need to have as many tools at our disposal, not just a low carb diet and fasting and optimal right. exercise, but everything in our arsenal, harness all the fields from different experts so mm -hmm. that we can give the right message. And hopefully we will be able to counteract this world of uh, big pharma, big food, and all the other things that are stacked up against us to destroy our health. Yeah, look, it's, it's not easy. None of it is easy, right? And I tell that to people all the time. 
you know, you need to use every arrow in your quiver. That's the only way it's going to ever work. And, you know, I even, you know, one of my little stupid things, because I'm, I'm a sugar addict, I'm a self professed sugar addict. And people go, Oh, you're so stoic. How do you stay away? Well, I always find it easier to just completely abstain, right? That's for me, that's the easiest part. You know, if I, I, I'm not around food all day, because I work at home, I, you know, I'm not, but if if I had a lounge to go to, or like you, you know, I was just at my doctor's appointments the other day, there's little nooks and kiosks all over the hospital, right, where you could get a, a cappuccino, and they had every pastry there. I pass by that thing, I can smell it. Right, but I you, you got to pass by you got to go by, I wouldn't even stop in for a cup of coffee because that could lead to oh my god that that croissant looks really good right that's the dopamine hit it is the dopamine hit so i know pass it by right don't put myself in that temptation and then the moments when when i do know that sugar is going to be had meaning it's a holiday or something and my wife made my favorite pecan pie or something she's toiled over this and i'm gonna have to have some of it oh poor me not that i'm gonna hate it i'm saying I will have to have it and I will enjoy it. My thing is, I have my espresso machine heated up, ready to rock and roll, because I know that if I have a piece and start drinking espresso right behind it, I can cut off that feeling, right? But if you have a piece and you got that last piece of sugar in your mouth and someone goes, oh, come on, have another little half a slice. Now you're off and running, right? Now you're in a different stratosphere. You're doing something different. But if I have that espresso right there, ready to rock and roll, and if I got to go squeeze out another one or a third or a fourth, I'll do whatever it takes not to go back to it, right? I need that yeah. bitter taste to cut off that sweet taste because I know that if I keep eating it, just like you, you know, the dopamine hit is over with, and now you're dealing with something else. I had a friend back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, when cocaine was a, a real thing. You know, everyone was doing coke back then. And um, I've never done an illicit drug in my life. And I don't know what it feels like to do coke. Um, because I've never had it. But this guy lost everything. Mm -hmm. You know, lost his job, tens of 1000s of dollars, lost his house, just to put this drug up his nose, right. And he got he went through rehab and everything he got, he got cleaned up and he was starting his life over again. And I was talking to him about it. And um, this goes to what you were talking about the dopamine hit. I said to him, I don't even want to say his name, because anyone listening is going to know who I'm talking about that that's a friend of ours. I said, <clears throat> What was it about the cocaine? He goes, you know what, a lot of times it wasn't he goes, I got more excitement about, okay, I called my dealer. He's going to be meeting me downstairs at the Starbucks. Mm -hmm. We're going to make the transaction. And then I'm setting up, you know, I, I called my girlfriend who wasn't anything more than someone who did Coke with him, right? They partied together and we would set up, okay, I got the Coke. I got, you know, X amount and we're going to meet, we're going to go out, we're going to drink. We have enough to do this many hits and this many bumps or whatever the hell they call it. He said it was more exciting planning for the event than when we were out getting wasted, right? Because the end result is you're now wasted, Correct. right? It was the rise in dopamine. It's the anticipation of the event that yeah. creates the arousal that he liked rather yeah. than the actual pleasure of consuming it. There was no happiness associated with it. Yeah. And that's when I first learned about that. I was like, oh. Yeah, when I'm thinking about, oh, my God, on my way home tonight, I'm going to buy a pint of ice cream. I used to be that guy. It's like I've worked 14 hours today. I rode a bike for X number of hours. I've done everything. I've worked my ass off. I'm going to get a pint of ice cream. Oh, when am I going to get Chunky Monkey? Oh, may maybe I'll get the one with the cookie dough in it. Maybe I'll get this. You know, it was that excitement. And then that it's in the truck with me, right? And I'm almost running lights to get home now because I can't wait to get home and get a spoon and, and dig into this, right? And I know this happens to everyone. And I'm gonna tell you why I know that. I leave the grocery store now and you see people in their cars digging in their bags, mm -hmm. 
opening up cookies and donuts and sitting there before they drive. They can't leave the parking lot of the grocery store. See, with I had a car with standard transmission. My truck had standard transmission, and I didn't have a spoon, right? But all I could do was think about getting home and having that, that ice cream. It was more fun getting home than actually having the ice cream. And I see people in the parking lots at Harris Teeter, at Wegmans, at Whole Foods, in the car, eating shit, leaving. They can't wait to get home, right? Absolutely. It's crazy how addicted we are to food. That's why, you know, we could talk about GLP ones and we go and everything else. And I think it's, you know, if you need that stuff to get started, but if you don't learn something and I'm bringing this full circle now, the dare, if we don't learn something in the process, we'll never get there. We'll just never get there. Well, the odds are stacked up against us. So that's why we need to learn how to improve the odds in our favor. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. Nadir, uh, do you have a, any place you want to send people to find you? Uh, they can look me up on my YouTube channel, which is Eat Mostly Fats. And then it's, there's another YouTube channel under my name, uh, Nadir Ali MD. Uh, those are the two active sites. I have stopped being active on Twitter because you waste a lot of time. You get into arguments, but there's no substantiative talk on there. In other words, the no. exchange of ideas is very poor. And then, of course, you can find me on channels like Vinny's uh, podcast and show. Um, I'm still very much under the radar. I enjoy being like that. I'm going to retire in about six months or partially retire in about six months. Really? I, yeah, because I will be uh, 64. Are you serious? Why does everyone look younger than me? I'm 61 and you look like you're in your mid 50s. At, uh, at you're too that. kind. Thank you. Thank I you. I had no idea that you were three years older than me. I think we had that conversation that we are. I, that know, we years years. I try to forget it. I try to forget it every time. <laughs> I hate you. No, but you, you, look young, you look younger than me to my eyes, Vinny. Um, but anyway. Younger to each other, but that's about it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, when, in six months, I might start a little better social media presence so that I can serve the community in a different way. But I enjoy what I do, and I enjoy being a foot soldier. Well, keep doing what you're doing. Hang on, because after we turn the mics off and everything, we have to wait till this uploads. It might take a whole minute. Uh, folks, if you like what's going on here, you know what to do. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, please go to VinnyTutters.com. Click through the banner. It puts a little coal on the fire. and It gets my train down the track. We're able to keep the show free for a gazillion years in a row. Rate and review this podcast. Uh, but up, up, uh, super fan page. Go check out everything at VinnyTutters.com. Check out everything Dr. Nadir Ali is doing on YouTube, including, what is it? Eat more fat? What, what's it called, Nadir? Eat mostly fats. Eat mostly fat. Go check out what Nadir Ali is talking about, because uh, every now and again, when um, I want to be educated, I will go to his YouTube channel and check it out. So you guys may want to do that too. So on behalf of Dr. Nadir Ali, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.